Hey everyone, my name is Nathan Pay, and welcome to our next episode of Coffee and Crypto. Today we have our special guest Miles with us again. Thanks Hi. for coming today. Thanks uh, for having me. I had me. such a great time with you last time when we got yeah. to talk, talk about Axie Infinity me and all too. that. I love it was the studio. It's a lot of fun. So what I want to do today, I want to talk about something that we've actually been asked quite a bit in our Discord within our community, is talk about how we vet and research these play to earn titles yeah. and ultimately decide which ones are good for us to bring in as a game guild and kind of what our process looks like. And then near the end of the episode, I want to kind of switch gears and we're going to talk about a new NFT game from Netmarble, Nino Kuni, mm -hmm. which I think what they're doing there is absolutely amazing to I'm help really with mass adoption. So we'll spend quite a while talking about our research and vetting process. And then we'll kind of end the episode talking about this new opportunity in the play to earn space yeah. i think so why don't we start with that sounds good because when i research a title usually what will happen is people in the community will either bring a title to me they'll say hey my friends told me about this project can you go take a look at it i kind of do a simple sweep right i'll go to their website i'll look at their discord i'll look at their white paper and then i'll send it over to you guys Mm -hmm. Now, what do you, you is usually the first thing that you guys do once we send it over? So generally what happens is um, a, a, what's it called? The channel will be open and I'll look for either their discord sort of official link section mm -hmm. or if they've made a link tree, because often a lot of these projects will have everything organized in, an, in, a, in a link tree. Yep. You know what I mean? And I think that's a really cool thing because it just has all of like the this is the all of the important links that you want, but you don't have to have 6000 sort of favorites or whatever to have them all organized so you, you know just you have can trust link tree for this link way. tree for that and they're all trustworthy exactly mm -hmm. so that's the first place that i go and the first thing that i do generally is read the white paper and i don't just like read it i read it very very thoroughly because i want to know just how much detail they have from the get-go to describe their game so if these guys are telling me you know they have a really really detailed tokenomics model for example, I was researching a game called, I think it's called Guild of Guardians. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gameplay sounds pretty vague from their white paper. They didn't really talk a whole lot about okay. what specific, like they talk about the systems of gameplay, but you don't really get to see a whole lot. But what they did talk about a lot in extreme excruciating detail is what their tokenomics model is like. Mm -hmm. And so their tokenomics model looks really clear to me and I really like it. So I'm inclined to keep that game on my radar because they have claims about how their gameplay is going to be and their tokenomics model looks good. And, and then... So the next step is mm -hmm. to just see what other people are thinking. And if there's a lot of people talking about it, so go to their discord, go to their general chat. Be like, Hey, everybody, how's it going? You know what I mean? And see if, you know, how many messages there were in the last like hour, two hours, yeah. see what people are talking about in those messages. See if there's like community events going on or if there's a lot of announcements. And so to get a gauge of the social activity is a really, really good way to get a gauge of if people are actually interested in a game or not. That's part of my initial kind of check before yeah. I even send it to you guys in the research team yeah. too. Is like, it's like, are there important. people chatting about it? Mavi is a great example. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when we first found Mavi, I went over to the Discord and it was like, holy crap, there's so much going on here. Yeah, I love it. You know, that just kind of further, it's like that next check mark on the list. Sorry to interrupt you, go ahead. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. That the, he, the, the next check mark on the list is to see that people are talking about this game in a positive light, that there's, um, actually it's going to sound a little bit frank but that there's concrete evidence that this game is a proper work in progress and that it's not just something that somebody's trying to shield to you you know what i mean mm -hmm. i've gotten into a lot of um i guess you could say like telegrams or discords or just social uh places for games like this where they talk about oh this is what the game is going to be like and we have this many people talking about it and there's no description of what the actual gameplay might be like yeah and there's no screenshots of what gameplay might look like you know what I mean? Basically, we've got a website and we have a white paper with the tokenomics model and there's nothing else. And, you know, you go into their Discord and you'll just see about 50 different people going, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? That's a bad sign to me. Yeah. That means that there's no, you know, that that people are not there because they want to be there. People are there because they think it's going to be profitable to be there or because they're being paid to be there. That's my guess anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's that's like a negative for me. Okay. You know what I mean? And then the positive for me would be that there's actual people there who are talking about actual gameplay systems and describing what they might think things are going to turn out like when, you know what I mean? Um, so maybe let's kind of recap for people here. You know, I'll take a look at a project first. Then we send it over to the research team. You typically what you're doing next is you're going to the website. You're going thoroughly through the white paper. Yeah, that's sure super you have a important. Firm understanding. Then you're going to the social aspects, kind of checking out the community making sure that things check out there. So yeah, once I get check marks in all of those things, the mm -hmm. next step for me is to go to their social, uh, not social, but like their media, I guess, um, 
web, I would call it. For example, they probably have a YouTube or they probably have a medium mm -hmm. or maybe there's a telegram that has things in it or maybe, you know what I mean? So then I'll go and check those things and see if there's like AMAs with the developers and if okay. they have their faces in those AMAs and yeah. what the things that they're actually talking about in those AMAs. And so the ones for the projects that we have ended up um, keeping our eye the closest on are generally ones that have a lot of real engagement with the development team via AMAs and things like that, where they tell us, this is how our game is going to work. And maybe we don't have it in our white paper yet, but we're, this is, we're going to describe to you verbally what sort of gameplay systems there are going to be like. And then people will ask, well, why haven't you released your token yet? And they'll say, well, we're still working on the work in progress. And once we have a minimum viable product, we'll consider releasing our token. That's a huge check mark for me mm -hmm. because a lot of developers know that people like me who are trying to find good games are really looking for proof yeah. first in the pudding before I want to put some money into a thing. You know what I mean? Right. So they're not going to really start their economic thing up and start their advertising machine up and everything until they have that because they know that that's the most important thing. So that's important to me. Me too. To, yeah. to either see that they're before that and they're not willing to, like they're not releasing their token yet because we're not ready yet or that they're after that and they do have a minimum viable product and that's why they've released their token and then look at the you know health of that token if that's where something we're you mentioned there too that i think is really important is the if the team is doxxed or not yeah right so it's important to me and i don't need the whole team to be doxxed like if you've got 65 people on your staff sure showing your top eight executive team or top eight team that's good enough for me you know we don't need everybody there but even just the willingness to put names behind faces for people who are creating the games is really important to me. Now, mm -hmm. I find we see this a lot more in Play to Earn. And where that opinion kind of came from for me originally was there was a lot of NFT. There is, still is a lot of NFT projects where there is no docs team. And that's OK. There's been quite a few successful projects with no docs team. <clears throat> But it still gives me a lot more confidence when people are willing to put their reputation, their name behind their product. I can't ever see that being a negative. Yeah, it's, really bo don't. it's a bonus is what I would call it. Yeah. And actually for a, for a game or a team that are not willing to dox themselves, they have to be willing to still talk to their community and be transparent about what they're doing yeah. and when they're doing it and when they're planning on releasing things. And another huge, really important thing for me is that when you release a white paper, or when, you know, either put a disclaimer in your white paper saying, hey, this is just, you know, to describe what we're doing here and it's it's subject to change. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't do that, then, you know, and you have like a, a roadmap in there, do your best to stick to your roadmap. Make the objectives that are in that roadmap your objectives and don't change them. Because if you change them, then you're going to lose the confidence of the people who are investing in your project. Which is funny that you say that. I don't want to get too off track here, but it's very common for roadmaps to change. I don't think I've seen a project yet that actually was able to stick fully to yes the but the map? ones that the ones that are doing it properly are the ones that have a disclaimer that say hey this is this is yeah it. they're transparent about it that's yeah. very important to me and there are there are some projects where that is not the case and you're right and they give people the impression that this is exactly how things are going to be and then they change things and, so now that we've kind of gone through that whole initial vetting process you know from me and then you what's what, what point do you start putting together the research paper in the it's document? actually right then okay. after i've gone through some amas and after I've, I've heard the developers talk about their own product enough mm -hmm. that i feel like i know about it from their perspective is when i start putting this paper together okay. because then i'm not just copy pasting things that i see online mm -hmm. i'm actually hearing the and i want it to be genuine too yep. an opinion from the people who are making this thing about what the thing is about Mm -hmm. And if they're dodging certain things, for example, the the uh, core aspects of gameplay is a super important thing right now. People want a game that they know is actually going to be fun. Yes. And not a game that sounds like it's going to be fun on paper and then turns out to be an auto clicker or something. Yep. And so that's super important to me. Once I know that that's, you know, where we're at with that particular question, and mm -hmm. I want to hear it from the developers' mouths generally, either via a text AMA or a, maybe they've done something on Twitter or maybe they've, with Twitter spaces, or maybe they've done something on YouTube yeah. and then they posted it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter to me, you know, which language it's in because I know that there's a lot of projects all around the world that are coming out. And with ones that are, you know, not in English, I generally make my way through it as best as I can. And mm -hmm. I'm able to discern whether or not these people are genuinely interested in making a real thing or not. And then once I figured that out, it's like, okay, let's put a, let's put a, uh, a research paper together and talk about those different things that they just talked about, how the actual gameplay might actually look like. And, you know, how the systems might actually work. Okay. And there might not be specific numbers yet, but if there is, generally I'll put the specific numbers in there and say, well, it's subject to change. What are some of the things that go into this research paper? What, what would you say? Two questions here. What's the key components of it? And then what's 
all the other stuff on the side. So key components of a research paper. Step one, somebody's going to go land on this title page and they're going to look at this thing because there are different people who are reading these research papers. It could be anybody, but they all fit into different categories. Maybe somebody is an investor, like a, somebody who has money and just wants to make money is reading this research paper. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's somebody who's a competitive gamer who's like, you know, wants to find the next game to get good at and, and be renowned for, you know what I mean? Or maybe it's somebody, you know, like a game guild like us who wants to look at this and see if it's viable for them to deploy on a wide level or not. Yeah. So I'll, I'll list in a few keywords and I'm trying to make them the same keywords. They're not standard yet, but I'm going to make a standard for this. Okay. Um, keywords for, for different, I guess, archetypes of people that might be investing in, in a project. Mm -hmm. And one of those archetypes of people, for lack of a better term, I would call them no coiners or no wallet, wallet and people who don't hold wallets. Um, and they're a valid, you know, and very important demographic as well because we want to onboard them. So, yep. so some of the projects will have the the, the 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 term no coiner there, and it's not meant to be derogatory. It's actually meant to to just refer to people who don't have coins yet, but we want them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, so yeah, once once people see this this uh, title page, they have an idea of at least the style of game that they're getting into. So it'll it'll have a genre, and the genre will generally be, be generally be pretty specific, um, and. Being that we've all played, or I've played quite a few video games, and I sort of know what sort of genres allude to what sort of yeah, things. Exactly. And sometimes I'll use terms like souls like. A souls like game is a very specific kind of game yeah. that can't really be described with other genres as well. And so, anyway, once once somebody reads that title page, they get an idea what the type, this, the type of game is that they're going to, you know, get into. If they like it, they can proceed further and they'll see me describe sort of the most concrete things I can find about tokenomics and about gameplay systems. Mm -hmm. Is this game going to be fun? Is there good tokenomic systems and ways to earn? And then once they've gotten through that, there's a section at the bottom for me to fill in, you know, if these guys have affiliates and who their affiliates are and to talk about their team and to talk about the different kinds of NFTs and what they do. Okay. Uh, and then obviously every once in a while, I would say probably every couple of weeks, I have to revisit all of my reports and see if, you know, if things have changed with those projects and sometimes, you know, more immediately depending on the, the priority of the project so yeah i think you kind of breeze through it pretty quickly there but there's there's actually a lot that goes into these especially into the meat of it like I know yeah there is more than that team write-ups in there we talk about the tokenomics yeah you'll that one is important you'll do a lot of there's a lot of screen captures and screenshots almost of certain aspects of it too like i for me running the business it's been a huge help to have you and kieran putting these together because i can basically say here's a game that i did the surface level research on bring it to you guys to the next step, you come back with this report, and then that ultimately dictates my next step as a business owner. Yeah. Are we going to actually go further with this? Now, maybe we should be more active in the community. Maybe we should actually try the beta. Maybe we should deploy a little bit of capital and kind of see how it goes. But what I feel like we do that's a little unique, and it's good that I mentioned this to everybody, these reports are publicly visible. Anyone can come in. You guys are welcome to come into our Discord. Typically, they're pinned in the channel of the game. So if you go down into our, our, you know, near the bottom of the server, you'll see this yeah. kind of giant list of games. And if it's not pinned there, you can always ping us and, you know, we'll make sure you get it. But we wanted to be able to share these with everybody to help you guys so you don't have to spend tens of hours doing research, too. And that's something that I'm really kind of proud that we do, that we yeah. we allow this to be The public. idea is that we want people to look at a thing and in 10 minutes decide if they think it's going to be worth investing some time into or not. Yeah, right? Because it does take a lot of time to put these together and yes. do the research. And I mean... Generally, I spend one, I would call it a work day, one eight hour, 10 hour period with breaks. I just spend one work day per, per proper report. And generally, I can produce a report that gives somebody an idea of whether or not they want. And the truth is, we're really not going to be able to keep this up. or not. Yeah, there's, there's so, so many, many games and, and more coming out. Oh, it's so nice to have other people working with me now, making reports in the same style. We have a template that we've been using for our company, mm -hmm. and so now the other members of the research division can use this template, create a report, as much of a report as they're possibly able to, and then hand that to me, and then half of my work is done, and I'm really appreciating that. Yeah, so, it's great. So and shout I mean, out to Kieran. I don't know if you're watching sure. this, but I love you. <laughs> yes, you're fantastic. And I mean, we might very well need to expand the research division in the near future, too, just with the sheer scope of the amount of games that are coming out, you know, because there is so much more to look at it now. And I think one of the biggest differences for me personally that I realize looking at play to earn web through games versus web through to web two traditional is web two traditional you can just pick up a game play it figure it out as you go web three you almost need to master the game before you play it like you, you have need to, do to a lot understand more you want to do a lot more research and really understand what you're doing before you've played the game yeah and the reason why that is and sorry to interrupt you no, but go ahead. the reason why i think is because a lot of these games have barriers for entry 
if you want to play a game seriously, if you want to play a game properly, you have to invest a little bit. Yes. And that makes sense because it, how would a game function otherwise? But uh, be that the case, you know, if you're, you're going to spend, you know, $60 on a game or $80 in a game or more, you want to make sure that it's something that you're actually going to use or that if you don't use, it retain its value. That's right. Yeah. Now, a couple other key things I think worth mentioning that we maybe breeze past a little bit is looking at 24-hour trade volume yeah that's super huge especially with their tokens so, actually i wanted to ask you a little bit about that yeah so sure. i'm i'm a person who generally looks at trade volume not just necessarily 24 hour but the entire length of a trade volume for a token or a okay, thing yep, yep. but i'm not somebody who is very experienced <clears throat> at tracking wallet addresses so okay. i was wondering if maybe you could tell me a little bit about how you track wallet addresses because yeah, i know that's something that you do sure and so i would like to start there's a lot of really good information there i i find i still look at 24-hour trade volume and all the other same stuff but mm -hmm. i'll give you an example there's like binance smart chain scan where you can put in any wallet address and it'll show you everything it's the blockchain yeah right? that's right it's transparent i don't spend a lot of time there and i'd like to spend more time there but effectively yeah, well, here's the thing, too. When you go into a project, you'll usually notice there's a contract address for their token. What you can simply do, like Bomb Crypto is a good example. They're mm -hmm. on the Binance Smart Chain. Take their contract address, go to the bscscan.com, put in the token address. You'll see where all that coin is going. You'll see how often it's being minted, what addresses are accumulating it. And then there's all kinds of sorting okay. options, too. So you can actually be like, I want to see the top 10 wallets. Who's holding the most of this coin? And then how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Yeah, right. Exactly. Because you might notice, well, wait, I'm going to look at the top 10 wallets holding this native token for this game. What other games are they in? Oh, what's this other token? And you can, it, it just starts to snowball. Okay. But it's really interesting to see because you'll start to notice some patterns where there are some top wallets that seem to be in quite a few of the same games. And you're like, hey, Maybe this other one is worth my research because this guy has half a million dollars worth of the freaking well, token. It's nice to know <laughs> that it's uh, streamlined enough that you can follow that easily. Now, there's a huge disclaimer here, though. I, I find when you get to that level and you start doing that, there's some inherent risks. And it's not what you would assume. So there's also something on the Binance Smart Chain Scan or ETH Scan. Uh, Wax has one called Blocks. It's like a dApp that kind of does the same searching. Okay. People will send you fake or malicious tokens because you can't uh, prevent yes. you can't prevent someone from sending you something. Right. Right. And a lot of people, you guys might have noticed this, you go on OpenSea and there's like an NFT there, which is an invitation to something, or it happens the most on like the scans. Like if I bring up my Ether wallet address, like one of my old wallets, I've literally got like 70 tokens. I have one that's called you know, Omicron. Okay. <laughs> I have one token. Okay, one Omicron. What's this? What do I do with it? You don't touch it, right? And then I had other one. Like the names are really funny. You, you actually, I actually laugh kind of going through the list because you can tell people just made up these. Yeah, names. the most random things. But what you're told is don't interact with them, don't open them, don't go to the contract address, just leave them be because anyone can send anything anywhere. Yeah. So as long as you kind of know that, like, don't think you just made a bunch of money and this milk 2.0 token that you have 5 million of sitting in your wallet that you didn't know about is actually worth money the answer is no right if you're not aware of yeah. what it is don't touch it don't yeah. interact with it leave it alone that's the disclaimer with these scanners is when that's you good. reverse like look up your own wallets just be skeptical about what you're seeing in there and don't worry about all these extra kind of tokens that you'll notice and assets and stuff yeah so people will send you this that and the other thing yeah and i and I, it's bait i don't even know if it's necessarily like i remember a couple of my wallets it wasn't like i ever gave out the address publicly i feel like they kind of just maybe rapid fired to a whole bunch of wallet addresses well just the same as stuff. they do with phone numbers i mean or airdrops right yeah. like maybe it was through an interaction that i did on a website somewhere else so that's kind of the issue there is some of them might be valid there might be a few in there that actually was like an airdrop from this. But if you don't know, I, f I found it just better well, not to touch let's, it. If I was, so I've, I've done some software developing. And if I was going to develop software to do this function, the software would look at a site like EatScan and find token addresses that have value in them. Well, that's how airdrops And then make work. a list. That's and how then, airdrops kind of work. Yeah, like, 100%. Airdrops will work it's in the way that It's not impossible to me that somebody could, without uh, interacting with you, collect your wallet address just because it has value, and they've seen that on the... On well, the I'll give you an example. If you connect to a website, 
what they can do is airdrop everyone who's ever connected or interacted with the website. Like swaps do this, right? Yeah. If you use a certain amount above a hundred dollars worth of swaps, then you can get an air token. So that's easy. Mm. But I feel like with the malicious tokens that are being sent to, it's more just kind of sending it to anyone. Now, yeah. with that being said, use the scanner freely, really beyond that. Because as long okay. as you know when you're reverse looking up your own wallets, there's some stuff and tokens you want to avoid. Yeah, okay. You can definitely look at anybody else's address. You can look at the contract address of that all is these what tokens. I need to hear. It's really nice to see. What I like doing is noticing how quickly the transactions are happening. Like I'll use Bitcoin as another example. Okay, yeah. If I see that, you you can look at it's like being minted every three seconds. Yeah, that's true. Right? There's Bitcoin coming coming out or being transferred quite off. Sorry, the heroes is another good example. They're coming. Yeah, they actually have like a they actually have a counter that I think comes from BSC scan that tells mm -hmm. you how many of their t total. How yeah, many and I meant heroes, minted. not Bitcoin being minted. It's the yeah. heroes that you can see. Yeah, as you the can contract watch them get minted, Yeah. So that frequency shows me there's a ton of activity still in the Absolutely. game. Absolutely. And then you could also reverse look up, well, how many people are holding the most of that asset? And I like that with coins, too, because it'll also show you, is the game controlled by whales or is there a diverse range? Because if you notice 50 percent of the token supply is controlled by seven wallets, you're like, that's generally hmm, not. That's actually right? one of the things that I wanted to mention about since you've been talking about um, about Bomb Crypto is that it. It really has a huge check mark there. There's a kajillion different people there who are is. putting their There's time and effort There is. There's a huge spread. Game. Now, yes, it's so actually, that's why I've got some faith in it. To be honest, and I recommend you. you do this. Actually, go look at the contract address for Bitcoin or SendSpark and take a look at some of the top okay. wallets. You will notice there's some huge holders there, but there's also an awesome amount of spread. There's mm -hmm. so many people involved. That gives me confidence in yeah, a project. Yeah, that's another knowing check mark. It. Now. Just kind of moving along because I realized, you know, we're actually running out of time here. I want to talk a little bit about Nino Cooney and uh, Netmarble and what they're doing. But before I do that, first, I just want to thank you for sharing kind of your research process. Yeah, thanks. How we vet games. And just a reminder to everybody that you guys can come see these reports in our Discord. Just go down to the game research section. There's all these games. And in any of those channels, you'll see the reports. Typically, they're pinned. Like I said, if they're not, you can always ping us. We'll make sure we get them to you. Please take advantage of all of our hard work, his hard work, and Kieran's. Also, I appreciate your constructive criticism. So in each of these channels, you're welcome to leave your comments about my reports, and mm -hmm. I will certainly take them into consideration. So yes, thank you very much for that. I think this was great. We've been asked a few times to kind of explain our research process, so I thought this would be a great topic mm. for us to cover today. But moving on to Nat Marble, to kind of set the, the preface a bit here, what really blew me away first... Nino Cooney, right away. Oh, you're like, I'm a wait, huge Ghibli fan. What? Like, okay, this is a huge title, super popular. Not only that, just in the genre in itself, it's like top tier. Yes. Right. Yeah, and actually, like I have a personal history with it. Like, me and my daughter, Matea, have played all the other Nino Cooney's from start to finish wow, with me really? and her. Yeah, she would run around the world map no and I'd way. do all the battles. Oh, okay. Right. That makes so sense. we kind of yeah, played yeah. together. So she was the overworld manager, I guess. That's, That's right. Cool. Right. Like Flying that. the blimp around yeah. and like running around no, and then I would do the fight. Do. So that right away it hit that like, oh, okay, this That's is something cool. that I, I can like play that. with my daughter. And then when I started to look into it, with the crypto part, because that's usually what I'm doing right away. Okay, okay how's the crypto aspect work? Yeah, What's going important. on with the NFTs? And what I liked, there was two things I liked and one thing I didn't right off the bat. The thing I didn't want off the bat was they said, there's no NFTs, no crypto yet. Mm -hmm. Here's the game. So at first I was like, ah, is it is it actually going to be worth investing the time? So my initial impression was not positive with that. But then when I, once I researched it, it changed. And here's why. They said, look, we want to do this properly. We are now, Netmarble is now going to be a platform that game companies can hire out to yeah. bring NFT and crypto implementation to their projects. Yeah. So we're starting with this game. Nino Kuni's the second one. And then King of Fighters is going to be later. That is super exciting. And you can download the wallet right now. It's super simple, really intuitive UI. They've yeah, got... I looked at that. It's very streamlined. It and is. That's another thing that I think is going to be super important for people who are not experienced with wallets and crypto. Same. Is they're going to want a system where they can just log into the system and it does it sort of for them and then they can do the thing. Well, here's what I liked about it. You were I was able to use the same email address I used to sign up with Nino Kuni. I set myself a nickname. I had a wallet. 
Yeah, see, like there was no no exchange involved or anything. Now, yeah. yes, cashing out and doing anything with those tokens, then you're going to have to take that next step. No, well, of course. But as far as intuitive, you don't need to know anything about NFTs or crypto to, to sign start. in, to start. And now you have your wallet where you can collect it. I also like that they have a two token system. And then there was even this swap token, which I have to do a little bit more research on. And then Nino Kuni itself I can tell there's two tokens, but they have all these other currencies within the game that can also be swapped for one of those two tokens. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of different earning potentials within the game. It's not like you get gold. Your gold is your thing that translates. So what that tells me is that they have a very broad and complex game system that requires multiple elements to function. That's what that tells me. Yes. So this game can't function with just two tokens because it's actually a complex game. So that's a check mark for me. It is. And then, of course... We've talked about this a lot. Fun factor is like yeah. where this whole genre, where played not so genre, but this whole industry has I haven't made my report for this game switch. yet, but at the bottom of all of my reports, there is an additional comment section. And generally, I put my own opinion about something mm-hmm. in there. But this time, when I write the additional comment section for this game, I'm going to write that Nathan's daughter played this game and she is not bored. Yeah. Because no. that is huge. Well, here's the thing. Not only did we play it probably for quite a few hours the first time the next day she woke up and went and played it off on her own see that's important she was continually interested in in following through now it's very microtransaction oriented there's lots of clicking and and collecting achievements and stuff it felt very like ragnarok which i like yeah because it's feeding the system right me too but now that i'm past level 30 the whole game has changed. It's like raid oriented, bosses, team, there's there's PvP, there's a kingdom that you oh, can I like build. That. Yeah, so the whole game has really shifted. And not only am I genuinely enjoying it because the the graphics are amazing and you it works on mobile. It works on mobile and PC. But second secondly, I see this as a historic thing this is a a well-known company yes that has millions of fans already i mean they mean guns duels they're not just making collectible art they're making something that does something that's right and they have this laundry list of games that they've made in the past they've already proven to people that they're reputable they know what they're doing Mm -hmm. now they're taking a title like nino kuni and helping bring mass adoption to nfts and crypto and that's also another reason why I'm just so excited to be involved. Yeah, in it. it's it's really so a dream team. We are running out of time here, so I'm going to have to end it there. But I'll definitely want us to follow up on this title in the next couple weeks and coming months. I'm going to be really interested I'm to so see. I'm so excited about it. Like I said, we're, it, they said that they're about a month or two away from actually the NFT or crypto aspect. So I figure this is a good opportunity just for us to get our feet wet, mm-hmm. learn how to play the game. Right. Help onboard some people who know Nino Kuni but maybe don't want to deal with the NFT aspect yet. They've shown some interest. Some of my friends have shown interest that are Same no here. who So I think this is a no good penny. ticket in to kind of get some yeah. people involved. But I just want to thank everyone for joining us today for our episode. This was a lot of fun. As you can tell, me and him could chat for hours. We'll definitely make sure he gets on another future episode here soon. But a lot of you guys have been asking us kind of what our research process is. How do we vet games? So I hope this was super insightful for you. And of course, if you just want to bounce some ideas or ask us about particular titles or even get us to take a look at some, make sure you come join our Discord. The link is down in the description below. And until next time, cheers.